The abomination is the eternal enemy of the Mundus. To do nothing in the face of its threat is to be complacent in its crimes. The only thing that separates the world from darkness are those who choose to stand between them. Welcome to Scrollplay, you nerds! I'm the Human Floyd, and as always, we're going to look at some community news from both mega servers, and then we will have an interview with a member from the community. This time it's going to be Protector Magi about roleplaying as an NPC. Stay tuned. I have an upcoming event that I want to tell you guys about. Uh, it's technically taking place on the NAEP, but I want to tell you guys about it before everything else because it's not your typical event and anyone can get involved. The Return to Alton Cormont is our second attempt at simulating a pirate town in ESO. The first one, the Curse of Alton Cormont, went really, really well. People had a lot of fun. Uh, my patrons can see the recording of that event on my Patreon. And uh, yeah, we had a blast. If you want to play a Khajiit pirate, a sleazy dock worker, a tavern wench, or maybe a corrupt guild official from the Fighters or Mages Guild, you should definitely check it out. The event is unscripted, there's no end goal for it or anything like that. Uh, if you're interested, post on the thread, I will send you some information that your character is icily aware of. Other than that, you're pretty much free to come up with whatever you want and roleplay out your role however you like to, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Oh, and there's going to be a public brawl on the first night, so you don't want to miss that. tinyurl.com slash altoncoromont2, and there's a link in the description. From the NAAD, an outburst at the Woodhearth Market caused panic and fur raising this last Turdos. A Breton woman claiming to be a Cirrus offered her skills in fortune-telling to the market-goers. Her final customer received an ominous revelation, which was shouted across the crowd. It included a fractured soul, black pages of some dark book, and journeys beyond Mundus. In a related story, the Marbrook Mages Guild has recovered an ebon-bound tome from Ilmiris a place that has seen a lot of activity recently. The book bears a resemblance to some of the things mentioned in the Cirrus's vision. The ethereal consortium has begun the lengthy bureaucratic process of gaining the guild's permission to peruse its pages. You can keep up with the story by following Secrets of Ilmiris on Tesso RP. It's in its third chapter right now, and it's held by our friendly neighborhood necromancer hunter Varland. Contact the name on the screen somewhere around here, and uh, definitely get involved because Varland is great at running events. From the Daggerfall Covenant and the land of Fell's Run, we have some news about a werewolf pack. They've been tied to a mysterious young woman with power beyond her years. She believed herself to be a Chosen of Vermina, whatever that means, but has since seen the error of her ways and left the werewolf pack behind. The pack, missing her calming presence, retaliated on the town of Fell's Run, with an attack that ended up wiping out all of them. Bad choice, guys. Uh, however, there is still the mystery of a man in the skull mask who the young woman spoke of as her benefactor. He has yet to make an appearance, but with his puppet turned towards the truth, it's only a matter of time 
before this mysterious man reveals himself. The Imperial Sixth Legion has been resisting the efforts of the criminal gang known as Namiya al Sakim, who have taken over the illegitimate business in the Wayrest docks since the death of Andre the Grinder. Refusing to kowtow to them, the Sixth Legion has taken it upon themselves to rid this scum from the docks. The Baron Gylus Cairn, who you've heard about in previous episodes of Silverthorn, has returned to his occupation of Baron without issues. The realm over which he presides has been peaceful, and spirits are high as people anticipate the construction of a highly anticipated arena. A treaty with House Lycolia has been signed, and trade between the two houses has been established. But despite all this peace and such, there are rumors that the young Baron is currently hosting several noble women in his court, that dog. Rumors indicate that as a man with means, land, and a patent to nobility, it is speculated that this number may grow. On the matter of the Three Banners War, House Cairn has declined inclusion in order to ensure a proper defensive military standing in its place. A small contingent of armed guards has been traveling the region, keeping the peace. But the House has yet to make an official comment on the matter. The temples in the area have been keeping records as part of a project known as the Scribes of Alessia. Any individual or organization who's out there for the better good can participate. Participants have their information provided publicly across Daggerfall Covenant lands through the temples. The existing records are kept open to anyone who's interested in perusing them. Just ask the temple. Lists of spiritualists of all beliefs are also kept. Priestess Kashaya organizes the project. The armed forces of House Vekon have been working to track down a group of cultists. These misdoers have captured a weiress and are attempting to use her powers against the people of the Daggerfall Covenant. Having taken down their false god, a Dramora, pretending to be the bad man, a locally recognized deity of crop failure and strife, the military force is now focused on the retrieval of the Weiress before the cult can do any lasting harm to the fields of Whitehaven. As the house celebrates second planting, there is much hope that this cult can be stopped in time. The Hammer of Atmora does bi-weekly PvP, and the next one is coming up on Saturday, May 9th at 8pm EDT. So you definitely want to check that out, get a hold of the names on the screen. The Vigilant and their allies are making the final push upon Trollheta. <laughs> um, oops, I lost my place. This always happens when I try to be a Nord. Uh, if you or your guild is interested in DM'd battles against trolls, mercenaries, and the like, then you want to get a hold of at Maliwanks. This event is taking place on Saturday, May 9th at 9.30pm EDT. The second DM Draugr Adventures is being hosted by none other than at Nick Transu on Tuesday, May 12th at 11pm EDT. You can get a little info about an upcoming plot if your character can survive the Draugr infested tombs of the north. And Surviving with the Nords of Skyrim Part 2 is also coming up. This one is about fishing and hunting. It will be at Thane Yegi's Drinking Hole on Tuesday, May 14th, 8pm EDT. Bring a pole, a bow and arrow, and learn how to fish and hunt in the north. In Morrowind news, Raymond's Dream, the Vigilant, and several others have been working with the Redoran in order to aid in the rebuilding of Ebonheart City. Cloth, wood, stone, and other supplies have been sent down to the city after its destruction in the so-called Ashlander War. First off in EU news, we have a very cool trailer created by the Polska Gilda, a Polish roleplay guild, so check it out real quick. Photographs mean nothing to the poor 
No news for the EU AD this time, so contact at xcarabur and let them know what you guys have been up to so we can report it in scrollplay. From the Daggerfall Covenant, a few days, an Argonian member of the Wayrest Mages Guild was asked to heal an old Dunmer, who claimed to have hurt his arm in a fall. It turns out that the elf in question was actually a Tavani mage. He tried to absorb the Argonian's magicka, leaving her drained and exhausted. The Telvanni claims that he did this only because he didn't trust the Argonian spells, typical Telvanni arrogance, and that he wanted to use her magicka to heal himself. But some people might expect worse, possibly even a ritual to extend his lifespan, which is not uncommon for the Telvanni either. He has been accused of assault and temporarily taken into custody by the Lamp Knights of the Wayrest Mages Guild. Rumors say that a public trial is going to be held next week in the courtrooms in Wayrest, presided by Judge Alaric Dragd. Dragd. Sorry. In EP news, Eastmarch and the Rift have both seen a rise in necromancy activity recently. It's not clear whether this is directly related to the Worm Cult or an independent group. But the rise in the troubling practice of raising the dead has been of some concern to the people of Skyrim. The Windhelm Fighters Guild, having been boasted by the Golden Flame officially joining their ranks, has been extremely active of late. A sudden surge in jobs for the organization has seen members venturing out into Windhelm almost nightly to combat new threats for the people of Nern. Meanwhile, the Fighters Guild continues to recruit more people into its ranks a popular choice for those who seek glory without involving themselves in the ongoing war. The Ebon Drakes, a now familiar site in Eastmarch, have moved to a new barracks in Fort Amol. The popular branch of the Ebon Heart Pact army has been continuing to be active in the region, notably taking on a cult and continuing to keep the peace across the hold. The move has sparked a slight increase in crime from narrow do wells who are more comfortable 
The Ebon Drakes haven't been absent, however, keeping regular patrols up in the city. Recently, the Ebon Drakes and the Fighters Guild are reported to have had a confrontation over an investigation about spies within the Pact. Arrests were made, but whether or not the potential threat has been dealt with is yet to be seen. Let us know in the comments if you have any first-hand reports on any of these events, or if you'd like to report on some roleplay of your own. Moving on from the news, let's talk a little bit about the interview coming up here in a second. We're talking to Protector Maggi. Uh, she roleplays on both the NA Daggerfall Covenant and the Ebonheart Pact. On DC, you might know her as Joya. Uh, she has a lot of characters, though. On EP, you might know her as a mysterious cultist. We're going to shift from talk of villains in scrollplay to talk about storylines, running them, being involved in them, things like that. And Maggi is the perfect person to bridge this gap because she runs storylines, is involved in running storylines, and usually as a villainous NPC. For those that don't know, NPC refers to the non-player characters, or the less-than-main characters, or in this case, a character who exists for the purpose of moving a story along. Back in World of Warcraft, I used to roleplay as a Tauren guard in one of the low-level villages, and I would give people quests um, to give them something to roleplay, essentially, while they were doing their low-level questing, and um, it was very rewarding for me personally, and I got a few people who weren't even interested in roleplaying to uh, try it out. Playing as an NPC is a different style of roleplaying, for sure, uh, but it's almost more rewarding in a lot of ways, and uh, you'll hear a lot more about what it can be like and the things that you can get out of it in the interview. If you want to hear about Maggie's roleplay as a villainous NPC, you should listen to the extended interview where she talks about her character, Blackworm Cultist. If you play on the NAEP, you've probably seen her around a few times or even been involved in one of her DM'd events. So if you want to hear about DMing combat, uh, definitely check out that extended interview. Welcome to the show, Protector Maggi. Thank you for having me. Duchess was telling me that you're her fellow Mook. <laughs> yes. Fr friend of Mooks. <laughs> you like to... I'm, I am a red shirt specialist. Yes, that's, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Um, I, you've played more NPCs probably than you have main characters, I would imagine, at this point. I've, I've, I've done a lot of deleting and then making, and then running out of deletions and going, Oh, gosh, I have to wait for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. First, I have my typical first question, which is how you got your start in roleplay. I started out... In ESO, honestly, uh, I've been playing MMOs for a really long time since probably about Star Wars Galaxies was my first MMO I ever played. Nice. But I never role played in any of them. I always was just there for the game. And I started playing ESO and started, you know, wandering about and hanging out in taverns just to kind of, you know, chill in there and whatnot. And started seeing people role play, and I'm like, "What is this? <laughs> I have not seen this before." And so um, I started role playing in ESO, uh, which was just exciting because I'm totally one of those people where my imagination is is very vibrant, and so um, I love stepping into the role of a character. I love um, being able to bring to life uh, things that are typically just written. So for me, the MMO environment to be able to role play is just very, very awesome. That's interesting that you're so new to role playing at, because most people that are new to role playing don't um, immediately get involved in like running storylines and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> But. I am okay. I am a closet creative writer. <laughs> I I don't tend to tell anybody that I do creative writing, mostly because I, I well, I mean, I've never shared any of the stuff that I've creatively written. But I mean, playing ESO, RPing in in ESO has really been this outlet for me for where this creative writing that I typically do that nobody sees is like very much 
right there and everybody's seeing it and everybody's reading it and I'm getting reactions, whether they're good, bad, ugly or whatever, like I'm getting reactions. Totally. And so um, it's exciting to me and it's addicting. <laughs> 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 oh yeah definitely and yeah i think that's you hit the nail on the head with the immediate reaction because when you're writing a novel or something you kind of have to finish the whole thing before you, <laughs> you hear uh, any thoughts on it whatsoever uh right and role play it's just this immediate feedback and then you just it like fuels you you can just feed off of each other's creativity and it just keeps perpetuating itself until eternity <laughs> yes it's very awesome that doesn't surprise me then that you're a writer because um, that means that you build stories and you build multiple characters and stuff like that. And so playing, being somebody who runs storylines or plays a lot of NPCs um, is is kind of like doing that. It's like doing that as as much as you can in an MMO environment. And I, I love it because a lot of the red shirts and the mooks and like I have one character right now that generically just has the black worm cultist name. And <laughs> really so that I don't have to keep deleting a character that I can just keep this one character and just change her name or or just not use a name, you know, and and even though, you know, it's this kind of, um, you know, non-determined character I am able to take her and because, you know, there are some, there are some times where you enter an environment with the name Blackworm Cultist and people kind of look at you and they're like, Chris must be up to something. And I'm like, no, I'm just innocently sitting here. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's, it's one of those things where it's a safe environment to have that animosity. Yeah. You know, and it's not like there's, oh, see, leave any bad feelings. There's not. I absolutely enjoy uh, welcoming people to to build that part of their character if they want to um, or to have that character development because it's it, it's it's part of life. Yeah. You don't get to go through life uh, like, you know, even even if you're role playing, you have consequences. You have things that are hard. You have things that leave you in a bad mood. You have things that, you know, you struggle through. Those are all a part of a normal, you know, existence. And so when you're playing out a character, if if every part of your character, there's this like, oh, this is great. And, and it gets resolved all the time. Well, if it's resolved all the time, then there's no real, you know, place to develop. But if you leave something there, you know, whether it's to brood or whether it's to be angry about something for a while or to, um, you know, have have a guilt feeling or something like that, even though it's not, you know, it's not supposed to be something that's positive. It's supposed to be there that maybe something positive can come out of it, but it's there for development. And I have always enjoyed helping people develop their characters. Yeah, and I feel like playing an NPC is a great way to do that, too, because um, you can kind of help people develop both the darker parts of their character through like that kind of stuff and the lighter parts of their character and i think it having villains as npcs is is really good um you were talking a little bit uh to me before about how um playing a villainous npc you kind of know that you're going to get defeated um oh yeah <laughs> You, you never you never go into a situation playing a playing a red shirt or playing an evil uh, NPC thinking that at some point you're going to win unless unless of course you've worked out something oh silly with the person where you're going yes they're gonna win this time but a later date they will lose or something like that you know there's there's always it, it's it's something where you definitely want to communicate out of character because there's a lot of times where people can um, miscommunicate or miss um misjudge something sure and yeah. where and where they want their character to work a certain way if the role play doesn't work to sustain that or to support that then that needs to be addressed oh Celia, so that things can be morphed a little bit and i'm i'm very flexible when i rp like if somebody goes hey like you know, your two cultists versus my one ordinator, like my ordinator's totally going to get owned. <laughs> yes. Yes, he is. <laughs> so, 
So maybe possibly you might want some backup. If you've gone to, into the encounter without talking, you know, without communicating, then there's more of a chance for, for misunderstanding. Totally. Like the, definitely when the, the ordinator came to, you know, attack us, I immediately sent, you know, a whisper like, hey, I'm just letting you know right now, like, we're not planning on killing your character. That's not going to happen in this <sighs> movie. Um, you know, we're just here to give you somebody to fight against. And, um, and you know, but we're going to be creative doing that. We're not going to just lay down and let you kill us. We're, we're going to make you work for it. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's really good, too, to kind of warn people ahead of time because um, I've had instances where I've had, uh, say, a very powerful NPC that I want people to fight, and uh, people can get frustrated when it seems like that they're not winning <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah. they'll get the feeling like oh so this person's just trying to god mod me or this person's just not willing to take a hit or something like that but uh when you're playing an npc uh usually <laughs> you don't have the same issues that someone playing like their main character would have as far as like oh i don't want my main character to get like totally beat up by this person or that person or in this type of situation or that type of situation with an npc it's like i'm like you said just here for somebody to fight <laughs> yeah and i i think that's also kind of negated because the character is not named a specific name mm -hmm. because the character is a generic name people's um, tendency to think of it as a main character or as something that somebody wants to hold on to is not there. Um, you know, it's like if, if my worm cultist had a lore specific name, then I'm pretty sure people would be like, well, they don't want to kill off this character. They put so much time into naming it and all of this sort of stuff. Right, and right. it's like, it's a black worm cultist. <laughs> like I literally, I literally have a journal that's like black worm cultist, like three hundred and forty three has died today due to you know blah 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 blah. <laughs> nice. Like black worm cultist number three, you know forty four, you know died after you know her sister's head exploded. Blah blah blah. Anyway, <laughs> so the for me because the character is not. Uh, it doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a specific lore thing. It's just there, and it has the generic, you know, that. Yeah. Uh, more of an entity versus an actual person. It kind of helps negate some of the confusion or some of the mentality that, that oh, my gosh, they want to hold on to this thing. Like, yeah, that I'll hold on to the character. It's level 10 so that I can go into Cyrodiil if I want to. <laughs> She's not a character that's, like, going to go see Endgame. <laughs> right. And I don't worry about deleting her. Like, it, her identity can change because of it being generic. Totally. Yeah, and that's that's a really interesting way to go about things. Definitely, I like it. Um, I know that you've had other NPCs, too, that were named, like, for specific plots and stuff like that. Like, haven't you done, made some NPCs for, uh, I think, like, House Gawadunin and some other places over there in D.C., too? Oh, yeah. Um, I played a cousin to a noble, and, and the character, you know, was to be, in my knowledge, a temporary character. Um, whether it was that she was just going to fade into being an NPC in the background or she was going to, you know, pop out kids and retire somewhere, <laughs> you know, that that was the, the gist of that character. And so as things ended up developing, there was this chance for there to be a really good plot and RP to come out of her dying. And so and and it would also create really good um you know, favor and stuff towards the, her, you know, new husband. And so I ended up playing out that plot. Now, um, <laughs> sometimes things do not go as you plan. <laughs> and, uh, and where, you know, plots could have developed, they didn't end up developing, but still, you know, I had a specific name for that character. I did not end up leveling it very much just because I kind of knew that I wasn't really going to be playing it as a, a fully developed character. Right. Not to say, though, let me say this. When she died, I had some feels. <laughs> I had some feels for that girl. Like, 
it was it was sad so it, it was it was rough <laughs> yeah no i know what you mean i uh definitely play a lot of npcs too and have had to kill some of them off before and uh some npcs started out as npcs and have kind of become like main characters almost or at least alts for me and the thought of killing them off is like oh no <laughs> i don't know if i yeah. could ever do that but then like the fact that they are an npc and that that might happen almost for me makes roleplay more interesting than being like oh this is my main i'm never gonna let it die well and that's the thing like you there are definitely people who have plots where the general idea of what you want to have happen is kind of there sure yeah. uh, it's kind of imagined but there's also so much that chance that that that's not what happens. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, I've had I've had a RP recently that that out of character, you know, things were being talked about about what would happen. A little a little of it was kind of like, well, your character's going to do this, and I was like, well, I don't know what my character's going to do. <laughs> so how about we leave that to the role play? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, what I ended up emoting was not what they expected. <laughs> But it ended up turning out being really awesome. Nice. It's finding a balance between providing um, the chance for things to go in any direction, Mm -hmm. but also giving the atmosphere that provides the challenges. So, yes, ESO by itself, like the game, when you play it, you have challenges because there's a storyline in the the game. But when you're RPing, you are making your storyline. You are making your own adventure, your own journey, what you want as challenges in that storyline. You know, sometimes they have to be figured out how that's going to happen. Like with Joya, um, some of the people from the arena that she fought against, like, they're still kind of looking for her. (laughs) You know, kind of killer. So, you know, and, and those are, those are NPC characters. Right. And so, yes, there's a chance there that if somebody wanted to play one of those NPC characters so that I could further develop her story, they could. Yeah. If not, I could just, I mean, it, to me, it's more fun if somebody did play those NPCs because then I have somebody to RP off of. But if there's nobody there to RP against, then I'm just writing a book to myself. Right. <laughs> So, so I would much rather like somebody be there to to play those NPCs, which is why like I love providing the chance to play NPCs for other people, because that's how you develop your story. Yeah, and yeah, totally, and it's so much fun too, like to be an NPC, and because then you can, you don't have to you know you can die, you don't have to worry about yeah. it, and it's and you can die in whatever gruesome horrible way you want to, or <laughs> you know, and. Yeah, I think if if more people went out there and played NPCs, we could have more like personal storylines for people because you can roll up like, oh, this is my long lost brother. This is the person that's hunting me down. This is the person that, you know, betrayed our family all these years ago, whatever it might be. And uh, so much more role play could come from that. I think if if people were more would leave a character spot, a slot open. <laughs> I mean, some of those abilities to just expand your creativity, you know, give you that opportunity to find that cool thing. Yeah. And then you're like, holy crap, I just want to take this on to something else. And that's, I love that. I love people finding something that they think is so cool in one RP and then bringing it over to something else. I love, I love continuing on RP from other RPs. Oh, yeah. I love dragging things from another RP into a new RP. I can give an example. Uh, I was playing on DC, and a couple of people had, um, well, okay, so Joya had run into this Imperial in uh, Dire Falls City, and uh, he was just kind of wandering around, kind of uh, new to the town, that type of thing. Um, had just come in and she goes, Hey, you know, fellow, fellow Imperial, I don't want to leave you, you know, with a, with a dry palate. Let me go buy you a drink. And so they get to talking and there, and she kind of gives him a walk around to the city, gives him a little tour. And as they're walking towards the docks, he runs into a friend of his that came in on a ship and he 
uh, he's bound. He's in cuffs and being taken in by the guards. <laughs> and um, and he's like, dude, you know, what happened? You know, why why are you in chains? Why are they taking you in? The guy's just like, you know, a bit out of it. He's been, uh, what do you call it, sun, oh, sun crazed? Yeah, he's been sitting out in the sun too long. Yeah. So he's he's a little he's a little off and uh you know he really doesn't remember who this guy is who the imperial is and that type of thing. The story develops to the point that um they end up jumping onto a ship and hijacking this ship. <laughs> and it's it just has a skeleton crew on it so that you know they're able to subdue the ship the crew easily enough. So that was that RP. Now a a group of people that are just coming in from another game, uh, just starting out characters that I know of. And I was just like, Hey, how about we do this? Like we all start out new characters on DC side and we'll RP that we are the crew of this ship. That's been, you know, subdued and then offered the chance to work so that we can get off of this ship alive. Nice. <laughs> so you basically got like a whole bunch of people to essentially roll NPCs for this like random plot that just sort of happened. Yeah. That's and so then cool. I mean, yeah. And so we, and so we played this crew, we got off the ship, we started questing and, and RPing while we're questing around in Stros Mackay. And, you know, and it was just this chance to carry over one RP to the next. Yeah. You know, and, and it was really funny because like the person uh one of the guys who had been in that first rp was in this second rp um and so when he realized what i was doing he sent me a whisper like you are you are just so crazy i love you <laughs> <laughs> so it was you know it was really cool to uh be able to do that and i i love doing that yeah that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, totally. The The whole NPC thing just, it adds more, it makes the world larger because you still have your main character and then you can go over and be part of a whole nother story and kind of get out of your head and, and think outside the box a little bit and stuff. So um, I guess I have just one more question for you. Okay. Which is if Molag Ball were to give you all of his powers for a day and uh, you could change one thing about the Elder Scrolls Online, the game itself, what would that be? Oh, the Lord of Brutality. <laughs> yes, if he allowed you allowed to dominate. To something. <laughs> dominate <laughs> Zoss. Yes, so. <laughs> um, I would tell them to get rid of veteran levels. Oh my the, gosh, me too. <laughs> the gating that happens, the gating that happens because of veteran levels is stifling the RP community. I agree totally. Because and and also the fact that we can't talk across factions in Cyrodiil. Like yes, I understand it it stops people from crap talking each other, but it also stops people from being able to RP with each other in Cyrodiil. And that I think is incredibly unfortunate because it's the only zone in which we can actually see each other. Yeah. And also, I mean, and I've sat there and I've thought about that, too, because I'm like, man, you know, in other games, you have servers that are PvP, you have servers that are PvE, you have servers that are RP, and then you have servers that are like RP PvP. So you have the threat, the risk of being attacked, but you can still RP. Yeah, totally. If you can go into another faction, see the other faction... And RP that you're a spy or RP that you're, you know, infiltrating a certain place, it opens up so much for our peers. It would be world changing for the roleplay community, no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, that was probably one of the best suggestions we've ever had <laughs> for, <laughs> for things. And I know everybody else is thinking it too. So that's uh, something to keep in mind, Zoss. <laughs> yeah. Please, please. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's been a great interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Maggie. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'll see you uh, when I see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next time on Scrollplay, I'm pleased to announce that we'll have Galleon and Mycroft on the show again. Here's the previous episode with them. And this time we'll be talking about how to use lore in the creation and execution of your storylines and roleplay plots. 
Heads up, I'm out of town next week for Psycho California Music Festival. Uh, so there's not going to be a character corner. It's going to be delayed until the Sunday after next Sunday. Um, so don't be waiting for it. <laughs> Have you ever played an NPC, a side character, or a character for somebody's backstory? Tell us about your experiences in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching. Peace. Thank you.